Morning, and welcome to the same page. I'm Dan Frank, and I just kind of sketched out this logo here on one of the free logo sites. Probably this is just something I cobbled together, but just your input. If if you want to comment, do you like it? Uh, get some rearranging to do on the bottom. Uh, I'm probably hiring our artist to do something better. Uh, to be honest, but uh, what do you think of it? Amen. Does it make the point that we're talking about being on the same page uh, with God eventually is what we want to talk about. But that's not our topic for today. Uh, we're going to jump right over here to this guy, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Wonderful gentleman. I, he's an astrophysicist, uh, an iconic national uh, personality and uh, gosh, what what I I know about astrophysics wouldn't wouldn't be a fog at the bottom of a thimble compared to what he does. Uh, and I'm I'm not saying anything in this video to be a uh, contentious of him or to be a rebuke of him. No way. I love the guy. Amen. He's done great things. Amen. And he deserves all the accolades that he has. And I particularly love this video this this video was shot in 2014 and it's a it's they're in walla walla washington which he the fact that he would even go to walla walla washington is if you've ever been there there's not much there i think probably a university but I'm, i've been through there many times uh but it's down by by hanford which is a an atomic waste dump it's where we made the first uh uh, plutonium to use uh, in Hir Hiroshima and Nag Nagasaki. Uh, at any rate, he's there in 2014. He's speaking at a, I guess an, a, he was invited there, some college it says here on the podium. And uh, quite the gentleman he is. Anyway, a 10-year-old boy asks him about God. And we just want to listen to his comments here about God, and then I have something to say about him. And, you know, I don't expect him to know about God. He's a physicist, an astrophysicist. You know, he doesn't make us, it, it, that isn't his expertise. But he takes the question, it's unsolicited, I assume, none of this was planned. And he gives the boy his honest answer that he's thought about, but he's not an expert on God. He's an expert on astrophysics, and he's way above my pay grade on that, you know. I'd be like an intern third grade come to, but I love astrophysics. I love string theory and all that kind of stuff. Oh, we'll get into it sometimes. I can talk to you. These these guys, they prove the Bible, literally, with things like string theory, you know. Uh, and that's not necessarily something he's put forth, but I'm sure he understands it full well. Uh, but anyway, let's just listen to a couple of minutes of it, if you'll indulge me, how he responds to this 10-year-old boy's question about God. And uh, I don't want to infringe upon his any patent, any, any copyright or anything like that, and so great that the, uh, so glad that this is up here. But let's just listen to a few minutes of it, a couple of minutes, and, and then I'll ab-lib some of his points that he makes later on and why I think they're important are erroneous. Amen. Just take a listen. This is a 10 year old boy asking him about God. Thank God we live in a country where that can happen. Amen. Praise God. Do I believe in the God that you believe in? Yes. Okay, that's probably what I was guessing. Um, is that the Christian God? Catholic. Catholic, that'd be Christian. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Um, every time I hear someone say that God, I ask, I ask people, what is, what is God to you? They say God is good and God is all powerful. And, okay. So then, you know what happened? This happened in the 1700s. The city of Lisbon, Portugal. 1755, I think was the year. From off and off by like three years. Lisbon, Portugal, one of the holiest cities in all of Europe, a Catholic city. All Saints Day, one of the holy day, holier days in the Christian calendar, back then especially. Everyone was in church, worshiping. That morning, there was an earthquake. And that earthquake, what buildings are most susceptible to earthquakes? The tallest, biggest buildings, and this is 1755. 
identified one of the tallest, biggest buildings in Lisbon, the churches. So, that morning, 80,000 people died in their churches from the collapse of the domes, the walls, and what followed the earthquake? Are you going to Guess what? A tsunami followed the earthquake, basically wiping the city of Lisbon clean. Okay. That was the beginning of what we today think of as the modern atheist. Because at the time, people said, if God is all loving, how could he have possibly done this? God presumably controlling the forces of nature. We're not talking about man's inhumanity to man here, which would be the consequence of free will. We're talking about nature. And so people at the time, led by people such as Voltaire, asked the question, if there is a God, and we had this tsunami that killed 80,000 people and wiped out a holy city on a holy day, collapsing churches onto people's heads, then either God is not all powerful, or God is not all good. If we define good by being interested in your health and longevity, that's a fair definition of being good, I think. And so that, that created an entire philosophical rift in the theological community, and people parted ways at that time. So when I look at the universe, and I see asteroids coming down to strike and rendering species extinct, I see forces of nature that would just as soon have us dead or extinct. I don't see the goodness in the world that people speak of. And am I, am I being selected? I, I don't think so. A tsunami hit Indonesia, a quarter million people died. An earthquake hit, hit Haiti, a quarter million people this is nature killing us. I've joked about it. And I said, if another earthquake comes, we should get the hint that Earth is trying to shake us off. You ever see a dog like shake? Amen. Praise God. It's a good answer. It's a wrong answer. But it's a good answer. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know, and again, he's not, Neil deGrasse Tyson is not a theologian. He's not a, a man of God that I understand. Uh, you know, I, I don't think he's absolutely opposed to God. In fact, there's a bunch of other videos where he talks about it. But he's made his basic stance here. Is, uh, and there's a couple of things I want to say about this. Is He's looking for evidence. You know, that as you would listen on to this, he'd say, show me the evidence of God. And that's, that's his point here. Uh, uh, all these people getting destructed and killed in a church on... On All Saints Day, which is the day before Halloween, just so you know, that was the major holiday. Halloween became the perversion of All Saints Day. And a whole other story. Amen. But anyway, his point is that, you know, because of that, that's when um, atheism took took root and began to blossom with the likes of Voltaire. <laughs> and I, I was a philosophy major in, in uh in college, and uh, you know, Voltaire, he, he would be the one that objected to God quite, quite strenuously. But here's the problem with that. There's a couple of problems with what he says. Like I say, I'm not going to play the whole video, although it's on YouTube at just Google. Uh, Neil, a uh, ten-year-old boy, asked Neil deGrasse Tyson about God, and it'll pop right up. Uh, here's the thing. He wants evidence that God is either all good or all powerful. And he says, I don't see that evidence when we look at this event in 1755. And he said that, and a lot of people didn't see that. So they say, well, maybe there is no God. That's what they say. That's, And this is their reasons for, for believing that or suggesting that is because they don't see the evidence of God. Well, here's the problem. If we saw evidence of God, you know, we would lose, we would, lose is the wrong word, we would forfeit grace. 
in my opinion, that's not written anywhere in the Bible. I've never heard anyone talk about it. But in my opinion, if we could look and see God, we'd give up grace. We have grace because no man living has ever seen God. So I believe God extended us this grace that we don't have to be perfect. <laughs> there, I mean, there's no man alive or dead that ever kept the Ten Commandments, including Paul, Moses, you know, all of them, Abraham, you know, name them off. Uh, I think even Noah probably had his, his issues, you know, and uh, although Noah was probably the best of them. Uh, but no one's kept the Ten Commandments. None of us are perfect. We all rely on this thing called grace that that Christ extend, that was extended to us in Jesus Christ. In other words, we don't have to be perfect, just faithful and keep trying. You know, there's you're not allowed to just sin, but the righteousness that we claim in Christ, it's not our righteousness, it's his. And it's put over us like a, a, a cloak, like a, a filter. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees his son, Jesus. He looks at us through the blood of Jesus. And so then we are extended grace to cover our sinful acts, which, hey, I still sin. I'm 69 years old. I've been reading the Word and studying about God since I was 24, 25, 23, 24, somewhere in there, about 1977, you know, and uh, I still sin. Not as much, not as big as sins, but there's still sins, you know. And what can be a sin? Let me let me just define. You know, we don't understand often what sin is like i'm a big one for building the wall on the border in fact i i i wrote a book here a while back you can, you can still get it called t wall and it had to do with trump's wall in one respect and this is a, a fictional novel uh, i don't know where it'll come up best but anyway it's on amazon it's a second book and i i my second novel this was my first novel one week and I've since finished the third one that's in editing, but it's done. And uh, we'll get it out soon. Uh, but in, anyway, in T. Walt talks a little bit about the wall on the border. I somewhat hijacked that whole project as part of this book. But anyway, it's in there. And uh, the, the reason I like the wall so much on the border, because the, the problem to me isn't so much the the illegal, undocumented aliens who cross the border from a host of countries, but it's that person from Honduras or Mexico or Guatemala that, you know, for every person that crosses the border, there's probably two that they're, that's against their convictions. They can't do that because they'd be breaking the law. And uh, they stand there on that border looking over there, and they're coveting the, the gringo's job. They said, man, if I was over there in gringo land, everything would be roses. I'd be able to send money home to all my relatives, blah, blah, blah. But it's still, it's coveting. So at least twice as many people as cross the border stay on the other side of the border and yet covet throughout their whole life about man, life would be so much better if we had the gringo's job. Amen? And you and I, in that we allow a porous border, which we have by and large, in large part, thanks to John McCain, the esteemed senator from Arizona, sat on his duff for decades and allowed people to flow over that border. But we... Don't stop it. And in doing so, in not enforcing that border, we are enticing a huge, twice as many people who cross the border are being enticed at our invitation to covet. And we could put a stop to that just by enforcing the laws that are. We literally don't need more laws. We have laws that say it's illegal to cross that border. 
We don't even need laws. People can think about that's yours. This is mine. I got to stay over here. You know, and that's why I say when I say no one keeps the Ten Commandments, you can break the commandments in a lot of ways. But I'm getting off the subject here. Tyson would say that give us the evidence of God. And, and he said, I'm, I'm perfectly well to go along with it. But I want evidence. And, and what I would say to give him that evidence, God would, we would have to forfeit grace. And uh, I, I can only speak for myself. And if I had to forfeit grace in Christ, it would be a dark day, a very dark day. And that figures into the rest of the broadcast here today. On another matter, Tyson goes on to say, and, and please listen to the whole video. I particularly love, he, he goes to give an ex extended explanation to this 10 year old boy and the boy stops him. He says, uh, I, I have to leave. I promised to be somewhere at three o'clock or four o'clock. <laughs> I mean, and he's so gracious with the young lad. Kudos to both of them. They both did a fabulous job here. And I, I, I totally admire Tyson. He, he has done well for himself. Amen. But he's not an expert on God. He's an expert on astrophysics. And he didn't come here to talk about God. He came there to talk about astrophysics. So this is way unfair to be... He's on the stage and he's got the microphone, but he's not an expert on God. And that's what the question is about. Amen. So it's not entirely fair to, to Tyson. Amen. But as he goes on to talk about this, he talks about, he says, over half the scientists attend church regularly or believe in God. They, they profess that they have a faith in a God. Over half the scientists. And, and Tyson, he says, I'm cool with that. That's fine. As long as they keep, they don't use their belief in God in the laboratory, in the, uh, 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 when they're searching the heavens with the telescopes, he says, as long as God isn't in that part of the science, then he said, that's fine. But when they step out of the laboratory and they go home and socialize and meet with their friends and their family, sure, believe in God. No, that's, that violates a huge thing that we call the first commandment. And the first commandment says that you'll honor God and put him before everything else in life. And maybe this is one way, one of the reasons that we have scientists all over the place and saying all kinds of things that aren't true because they're not beholding to a God. Because if they were, if they had God as a first priority in their life, God, you know, first commandment says, have no gods before me. Well, getting your next grant or, you know, getting some headlines, that that's a God. And you can't have that before God. He, he's he got to be the first in everything. And, and just from experience, I can tell you that you won't even bruise one of those bottom nine commandments before you've ground that first one into pulp. Amen. It's that way. Amen. You got to honor God and keep him first and top priority in your life in all things, in the laboratory and outside the laboratory. Because you have relationships in that laboratory with colleagues, with the press, with uh, administrators at wherever you're working for, the people that are funding. You have responsibilities to those people who are, who are funding your enterprise, your, your investigation. And you have uh, responsibilities to be honest with them and forthright. Tell them the whole truth, whether they ask about the whole truth or not. You can't just give out snippets and omit things. Amen. Praise God. And God is who instills that. It's often been said that capitalism is a great system, but it, it needs to operate in the 
foreground of a backdrop of mor morality, which we get from God. Otherwise, capitalism doesn't work, and you have uh, uh, capitalists doing things that are unsavory and dishonest, and you know uh, they're acting on greed, blah, blah, blah. No, uh, capitalism requires a moral background or it won't work. Amen. Praise God. Maybe that's why socialism doesn't work either. Whole nother issue. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. But uh, I apologize. My thoughts get all over the place. But, you know, he, he, sa he says he's fine with, with God as long as they're not serving God in the laboratory. And in there, they're serving purely what they can see, the evidence. Let the evidence speak. I, I wish I could play the whole thing, but I'm, and I would rather have his words, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but I don't want to infringe on any copyright either. You can listen to the whole thing, get the words from his mouth. But I think I'm paraphrasing reasonably well. But see, we can't do that. He, he, it's a subtle thing that he's asking. It seems reasonable, but it totally throws Christianity to the to the to the ditch on the side of the road. You know, because without that first commandment, we we got nothing. We're nowhere. We got to honor God in all things in all realms. Put Him first, and then other things operate. Other things we do, we use God as a backdrop to govern our relationships and our activity and the things we say in those other things. Now, I want to, you know, and he, he's talking about what, what, 1755, you know, and he, he goes on to talk about Galileo and blah, 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 and makes some interesting points about that and kind of to God's uh, chagrin. But I want to point out something that uh, Dr. Tyson didn't. And that's this guy. I think I got the right tab. I do. The forgotten preacher who predicted black holes a century ahead of Einstein. Now, as this preacher's name is John Mitchell, and that's not to be confused with John Mitchell from the Watergate eras when Nixon was president. There was a John Mitchell that had some position of authority in the White House, and you put John Mitchell in your com computer, and it's going to take you that. This John Mitchell's forgotten about. You know, he was from in 1783, right here, 1783. Oh, I shouldn't have done that because I've lost something from further on down. You know, an English rector, preacher, predicted black holes using Newton's classical mechanics. Amen. So here's a picture of black holes. Now I'm just going to cover just a little bit down here. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, perhaps, right here, perhaps, most incredibly of all, John Mitchell did some other things. In fact, he's known... Uh, up here, right up here, it, it, as by in some circles, the father of seismology and magnetometry. But it didn't stop there. John Mitchell, most incredible at all. And this is back in the 1700s. Remember, he was he was from 1783. Uh, uh, so about that time that atheism was getting uh, taking a hold by the likes of Voltaire, according to uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, which I don't know. I haven't researched that. I've taken Tyson's word for it. But perhaps most right here, most incredibly of all, John Mitchell was the first person ever known to make the connection between gravity, escape velocity, and the light that leads to creation of black holes. In fact, Mitchell predicted the existence of black, hell, black holes more than 130 years before Carl Schwarzschild declared their existence using Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1916. So 130 years before that, 
a little old preacher in, in, in England had already realized just as a hobby, math was his hobby, science, uh, science uh, that type of thing, magnetism, seismology, these were all things he was just interested in. But his main deal was he was, he was a preacher. Amen, praise God. Uh, now it goes, the thing is, one thing we should point out in, in all fairness, uh, he was at Queens College, uh, 1749. Whoa, when was he born? Does he give that year? 1724. Okay, uh, let's go on down here because a couple other points and I. He was, uh, he was also elected to the Royal Society. Okay, right here is something we sh should make a point of. John Mitchell, BD, I don't know what that means. It probably has something to do with his degree. Is a little short man of black complexion and fat. <laughs> Not the type of person that you normally look at as being authoritative, except for the uh, dark complected. Now, we don't, there's no pictures of John Mitchell that I've ever found, and I've looked quite extensively. But, um, and there's a few sites that put one up, but they're, they're picturing someone else. And we don't know if he was just dark complected. Was he Italian, maybe? Dark olive skin? Was he from the Middle East? Uh, was he a black man? He could well have been. It says here it says black complexion. Other places it says dark complexion. Uh, but uh, but Tyson should be interested in that if he in fact was a black man, you know, and, and that would be great. I mean, uh, they need a feather in their cap like that. But uh, this this is what this is 1755. He, he talks about the Lisbon earthquake. <laughs> That's Lisbon, Port Portugal. That's exactly, you know, so part of the things, things that read, uh, that led, boy, my mouth just does not work like it should, that led John Mitchell to make some of the uh, discoveries that he made was part of this Lisbon earthquake of 1755 that... Tyson was talking about, but let's go on down here to the bottom and get just the, uh, there's even a book about John Mitchell. It's not a very long book, uh, but, but it, it, there is uh, a short book about dark scars. Okay, Mitchell explored this idea in his paper on the means of discovering the distance, magnitude, and a, a fixed star in consequence of the, I'm not even going to try to say that, the velocity of their light, uh, which was the Royal Society of 1783. Uh, and while the idea that a sufficiently massive star slows light down isn't accurate more than on, a, on that in a bit, the more radical implication of his idea turns out to be more present. Present? No, it's not present. What, I don't even recognize that word. In his paper, John Mitchell described a, a body whose mass was so great and his gravitational pull was so extreme that the escape velocity exceeded the speed of light itself. Amen. Praise God. Mitchell realized that the dark star, Mitchell never actually names the object uh, he was describing, the dark star, but would be applied by later writers, would be impossible for any astronomer to see directly since the light it emitted could never escape its gravitational pull. If all of this sounds familiar, it's because Mitchell, John Mitchell of 1740-50 uh, fame, is, take, is talking about the defining feature 
of a black hole. Now, you, you know, now here's this picture of this guy. This is Pierre Simon, Simon de la... Anyway, he picks this up, I think, a century later and talks about it some more, but he's only uh, regurgitating, basically, with Mitchell's work. He elaborates on it, you know. Uh, so... By then, however, the French astronomer, there was a, a century in there where that John's Mitchell, I read this whole thing, where that John Mitchell's findings didn't jive with the some of the mathematics and the models of that day, so it, it was not really explored. But essentially later, this guy come on, a French astronomer, Pierre Simon de La Passe, had also published a theory about such invisible stars in 1796, also based on the classic mechanics of Newton, uh, as particular uh, as a particularly prestigious astronomer in France. His work overshadowed uh, Mitchell's. No surprise, but the least, but at least when people rejected the ideas of dark star. They dismissed Laplace's work instead. Hmm. Mitchell's work also suffered from his own disinterest in promotion in defending his claims to discoveries that he made. His historical uh, history of science is shockingly, uh, no, no, not his history. The history of science is shockingly nasty is a shockingly nasty business full of bitter feuds and rivalries uh does it say anymore i don't think no but you know 1750 1780 a long time ago there was a preacher who outshine he he figured out that black holes existed and we still don't know a lot about them we know they're there but we don't know anything about them and and this is in contrast to uh neil degrasse tyson's point that people that it's fine to have faith but you should have faith outside the laboratory outside the science and let the evidence guide the science well it may be the case that John Mitchell did exactly that, that he let the evidence guide his work in discerning black stars, dark stars, or black, black matter, black holes. But at the same time, that, that was his side gig. He did this just for a hobby. His main thing is he was a preacher, and that was his, his primary existence amen pray praise god he he basically in one sense violated what uh neil degrasse tyson says needs to be and that that first commandment is just so important and we we can't do what neil degrasse tyson says to do and it was keep the keep god out of the laboratory without violating that first commandment and you just can't do it. I mean, and that first commandment is so important. It's, it's uh, have no gods before me. It, it, it isn't as though we're giving that to God. There are no gods before God. There, there were no gods before God. It's his. And when we put something in front of him, it's like we're trying to, take that from him it can't it can't happen you know that's that's surprisingly it's like a black hole like can't escape and we can't take from god what is his and and what is his if there is that there are no gods before him that was the first commandment and and the bottom nine that flow from that all are anchored in that. And like I said earlier, you won't, you won't even bruise one of those bottom nine commandments. You won't lie, steal, uh, 
commit adultery, uh, covet, you know, you won't do any of those things without first just grinding that first commandment into a pulp. And it's, it's like you're being, if, if you go that route of denying that first commandment, you're being like this dark star that uh, John Mitchell described in 17, what, 80 or something. Uh, and and you're, you've got, you're, you're putting so much of you on the table that theoretically God can't present himself. Well, no, that's, that is, that isn't possible. That's, that's not possible. You can't take from God who he is because you're just a creation of him. You're not God. I'm not God. I can't, I can't take the fact that I owe him a position above everything else in my life. I can't take that from him. You know, that's, that's why he says it. We, you know, he's not telling you not to do it. He's telling you, you can't do this. He said, if you go down that road of putting something in front of the first commandment, you're going down a road to desolation because everything after that is going to be false because it doesn't include me. And uh, I, I don't know how to explain it better. It's like you might steal from your parents. You might lie to your parents. You might uh, disappoint your parents. You might covet something that your parents have. Uh, or um, this could be in respect to a girlfriend. But... but that is totally different if you try to attack who your parents are and discredit them and maybe even kill them. That's totally different. You can't do that. They are your parents. Nothing you do can change that. Amen. Praise God. And if you go down this path of denying that first commandment, you're going down the path of changing something that is an absolute. And, and God's just, he's not saying don't do it. He's saying, please, you can't do that. It's impossible. It would be like the light escaping from one of these black holes. There's so much gravity. Light can't go fast enough to get out of that gravity. Hence the black hole. And I, I don't care what, what you're involved in. If you're going to set the first commandment aside so that you can go in the laboratory and look at evidence, which is great. I hope they don't stop doing that. That's important to go in the laboratory and look for evidence, but you have to take God with you. And while you're in there, all things have to operate under the backdrop that he first, before you take a breath in the morning, is the number one priority. Amen. Praise God. And, and that's why... Other than the fact that if we gave, if God all of a sudden gave us the evidence that Tyson is requesting here, you know, he said, well, he said, from the evidence, either God is not all good or he's not all powerful. So he's wanting the evidence, see? He's not opposed to the idea. He said, show me the evidence. If we gave him the evidence, in my opinion, we would forfeit grace because we would have no reason to have grace. We have grace because we've never seen God. There's no evidence of God. So God gives us this liberatory, this liberatory, this liberty of grace. Amen. And what a blessing it is. Now, it's not an excuse to stay over in that sin. Amen. Any sin you're engaged in, you need to repent of it. In fact, first church service I ever heard as an adult, 19... 77 78 up in Hayden Lake Idaho went to see a guy preach in a in a converted horse barn I mean they they shoveled manure out, manure out of that place a year earlier and poured a concrete floor so they could hold services and the first Sunday I went that's the first thing he said he said if you're not going to repent and that means turn from your sins he said you're wasting my time you're wasting God's time, and most of all, you're wasting your time. Because he said, apart from repentance, there's no salvation. Amen. Praise God. 
And that's, that's the best truth I ever heard. You know, I, I had, as a young lad, I went to the Baptist church and they never preached that. <laughs> they, they wanted people to come to the altar every week. And, and this guy up in uh, Hayden Lake, Idaho, I, I could tell you his name, but that's a whole other issue. Very controversial issue. Uh, anyway, he, uh, he said, no. He said, come to the altar. Yeah, please, the altar's open. Come up here and repent and, and be forgiven. But amen. But if you aren't going to change from your ways, don't waste my time, don't waste your time, and don't waste God's time. Because it all requires repentance. I mean, turn away from that sin that you've been doing. That made sense to me. That made sense. You know, I, I love when God makes sense. Maybe that's like the evidence that Tyson has taught me. He'd love to see a piece of evidence. I love it when I hear a guy say something that makes sense. Amen. It, that, that, you know, that was practical. That, you know, you couldn't refute that. Amen. Praise God. But that's my two objections to what he has said in that video. And uh, you be the judge. You be the judge. I'm not the judge. I'm just giving you my opinion. And it is my opinion that if we had seen God, we would lose grace. But I think we would. I think we would forfeit grace to, if, if any man had saw evidence of God. There'd be no reason for us to have grace. We have grace because it's all speculation. It's all faith. It's all just what we believe. So we have grace then in Christ. And Tyson doesn't capiche that prospect. Neither did Voltaire. Neither, neither did a bunch of others. And yeah, you know, there might be a tsunami that comes through here tomorrow and wipes me out. Amen. It doesn't change who God is. He's still loving. You know, I can't look at the situations around me and make statements about God. Why? First commandment, because he is the top priority. Nothing can take his place. Nothing can be asserted above him. And so often, we that's the first thing we do. That's the first thing Tyson wants to do. He wants to put science and the pursuit of science based on evidence ahead of God. He literally asks for that to happen. Is it, you know, half the scientists uh, are faith people? He said, I have no problem with that. As long as their science, God is out of that picture. He says that their science has to be evidence-based. And there's a window in which that is true, but not the whole window. You know, that they have to take God into that laboratory. Amen. If they don't, then there's no hope for them. Amen. Praise God. Because you it isn't like you could take God being the top priority from him. You can't take that. It'd be like me take being no longer saying I'm no longer the child of my parents it's not it doesn't have I don't have the capacity to do that you know that that has been said and that that's what the word is warning you don't go down that road because it's a dark hole down there and we're talking about dark holes hey I'm glad to share with you about John Mitchell from 1750 1780 he is the forerunner the father of black holes. He was the first one to imagine them. And in contrast to Tyson, I, I would say, hey, Mr. Tyson, a man can serve God, keep his faith in God, worship God, and keep that first commandment foremost in his sight, and yet God will allow him to see things two or three centuries before other people even begin to. And I think I experienced that in my own life. I, I have ideas that are, I write them down, I put them in these videos. I honestly don't expect anyone today to catch on to what I'm talking about in some ways. Some of the things I have to say, I'm only recording for people two, three, five generations from now, maybe a hundred years from now, Somebody will read that and say, oh, wow, in 2023, Frank said this. And now we're in a situation where I can see where it might be true. See, the same thing happened with John Mitchell, but he took God in the laboratory with him. 
Amen. Praise God. You be blessed. Stop on the same page. Oh, what did I do with my logo picture here? Is that it? Is that it? No. There. Tell me what you think of that. You know, is that good or am I? Am I, I don't know why that background's got that swerve in it. But, hey man, I kind of like it actually. It's bold, and I. And I know the letters are not the way an acronym is supposed to be, but I think the Bible's like that. See, sometimes you have to start in the middle and work your way out, and it's it it gets you there. But it, you know, it, it does doesn't read front to back. You know, Amen. Praise God. This is Dan Frank for Stop on the Same Page. You be blessed. Amen.